Hi, I'm Catel Le Goulven, and this is Mission to Change, the show where I hear from people who turn business into a force for good and learn about their journey to make it happen. The mission of every organization should be to shut down because then we are doing a good job. We had tipped the needle and then if we stayed, we were just staying in business to stay in business. We did not want that. So we took the right ideological choice. In our fifth episode of Mission to Change, we look at the role of social enterprises to create systems change. To explore this complex dynamic, I discussed with INSEAD alumna Cynthia Rayner and serial social entrepreneur Jiro Bilimoria. Well, I'm Cynthia Rayner, and I am a researcher and lecturer at the Bertha Center for Social Innovation at the University of Cape Town's Graduate School of Business. My name is Jiro, and I'm a social entrepreneur. A social enterprise can scale impact in different ways, as we've heard in previous episodes, but its largest impact lies at the systems level. Systems change is what Cynthia has been researching since she graduated in SEAD in 2007. So let's ask her how it works. The definition that I like is from social innovation generation. It's um, shifting the conditions that hold a problem in place. Um, for me, um, the, my, my kind of journey to learning about systems change started um, after my INSEAD MBA. Um, I started my career as a management consultant, but then after my MBA, I moved into the nonprofit sector. And through this work in the nonprofit sector, I mean, these were exemplary organizations, but really I felt in many cases that we were putting band-aids on issues, that we weren't really getting to the root of um the, of the problems. And so I was invited by the Bertha Center to do a series of case studies about systems change. Now, this was almost a decade ago. So we, we were just starting to use that term systems change. And really, we didn't know what it meant. My co-author, Francois Bonici, and I were concerned that a lot of those conversations were happening in funder conversations, in Global North conversations. They weren't really being discussed in the places and in the conversations that we were having. Um, we were situated in an institution in the global south. We were seeing that, in fact, systems change really involved issues of equity and justice, not just issues that were technical in nature. And in order to get at those root causes, you really have to shift mindsets. You have to shift power dynamics. You have to change the way relationships work. And a lot of that conversation was not happening. So the book that we wrote was really to uncover this really important work that many of the organizations we visited they were already doing, but it wasn't being publicized in that way. Um, and we really wanted to get those voices into the conversation. So we um, had access to a database of more than 300 social entrepreneurs at the Schwab Foundation. We were able to review those organizations and select those that we wanted to visit. Um, we visited um, eight of them, and many of these organizations were doing systemic work. Um, they were really shifting those conditions that were holding the problems in place. And we learned directly from them how this work is done. Um, it was through that work that I met Jeru. Um, she was running an organization at the time called Child and Youth Finance International. Um, but she had started many organizations before that. And so I learned from her really what it means to be um, someone doing systems change. Jeru is by her own definition a serial social entrepreneur. She has created several enterprises which were designed so they created systemic change. What I found fascinating when reading about each enterprise was that every single one of them seemed to be building on the previous one, each transforming an area of the system. This journey began with a seemingly simple action, giving street children access to a reliable phone line. I learned systems change from the streets. I think when you work with a homeless person or a street child, and that's where my first work was, one realizes how alone they are and therefore how much the system needs to work to support the street child or the homeless person to get on. So when I was in New York and working with Coalition for the Homeless and Homeless People, that time, we used to call to get them shelter, but there was nothing else which was being done with health, etc. When I moved to India to start the health, and I started child lying, well, I should say the children made me start child lying. I should say this very consciously. It was because no one was there for them 24 hours a day. And 
It was in the nights that the police would harass them. When they were sick, they were not given admission to hospitals, so they would even get basic health care admission. So for me, my learning was that if we really have to do something for the street kid, for my street kid, I would need to work with all the different systems. And that's how Childline, even when it was started, was started with getting the police commissioner to inaugurate the most feared person. But I thought if I could work with the police commissioner, then there would be less. So we started police training, which street children started doing with them. Similarly, we got the healthcare system involved. So then we could get healthcare protection. Um, similarly, we started working with the railways. The telephone was a 1098 number. So basically, to provide once, and that was my learning. And that was the model which then went global to other developing countries. So getting all these key stakeholders is when I learned about systems change, took that forward to Aflatoon with for providing social and financial education for children and then seeing how we could do. And in Aflatoon, very see, and this is when I met Cynthia, in Aflatoon, very soon we realized that Aflatoon as a brand providing social and financial education could grow. But if we wanted to scale the idea, we had to create a separate organization. And I remember discussing this with you, Cynthia, when we were even taking this decision. And that's when the first time on should we continue? Because normally you're taught to continue and scale. By taught to continue, I mean since traditional education says you have to do it. But we consciously split to start Child and Youth Finance International because governors of central banks would not work with us otherwise. Jiro's journey to scale impact had reached a tipping point. One that called for an uncommon decision in the life of a social enterprise. What we had said is we would look at shutting down Child and Youth Finance International when we had had a certain, we had reached a tipping point for policy change. We had defined that in terms of that governments would start look putting financial education and inclusion for children into their policies, into the academic curriculum, into having child-friendly bank accounts, in being much more inclusive in how they were reaching out to young people and children. So that was where we said we would take our cacao. So when we crossed uh, uh, 70 countries, we realized that we uh, had reached a tipping point and we thought, do we need to continue or is our existence diminishing marginal returns? In parallel, we had partnered very closely with OECD on INFE, which was the network which OECD had, and they were doing a phenomenal job. So we thought instead of us continuing, why don't we hand over? They worked in the developed countries. Our work was much more in the developing countries. So we said, why don't we take our network and merge it with OECD, which is what we did. There were excellent bi and multilaterals whose job it was to do this. This was policy shifts. We had tipped the needle. And then if we stayed, we were just staying in business to stay in business. This is very inspiring. And, and yeah, it's true. I mean, you had reached your end game in a way, right? And others could like take it to the next, next level of impact because they were already structured and equipped to do so. They really did quite a big effort to see what would be the indicators that would show that, in fact, that tipping point had been met. And I also just want to point out that there was really a mindset shift that went alongside those policy shifts. And that's when you see that organizations, when they close, maybe that systems change hasn't been achieved. But in the case of um, youth finance, education and support for kids, um, there was really a shift in the mindset of both policymakers, education systems, financial systems that in fact children were in fact economic players and needed to be educated as such. And so it wasn't just a policy change, it was actually a deeper shift that had happened um, that Jeru and her organization and her team were able to show had happened. So I think that's a really important note, um, the, the rigor that they did as well as that mindset shift. So the mindset shift that you're talking about, which indeed is uh, uh, as crucial, is not uh, uh, more crucial than uh, you know the change in policies, 
were, were the metrics that you just mentioned also covering that mindset shift? Was that part of the metrics that were being monitored? And if so, what were the specific metrics that were used to, uh, to monitor that evolution, to, uh, to, to account for that, to measure that? The main metrics which were there were basically we had tracked each country from the initial conversation where they had nothing right through till it was integrated in the system of the government. It wasn't steps, but a 10-point scale on which we looked at the metrics. In each metrics, we had five or six sub-metrics to see to what extent and where they were and how they were looking at it and what was needed. Our learning was that uh, for us, be, success was when it was adopted by governors of central banks and by their teams because we know governors change quite often in some countries, whereas the team, you know, level four, five, six, I always say if you want to do true systems change, don't start at the top, start with the core. And that's the mid upper level, which will always be there. And they had adopted it and they owned the idea. So what happened is that there was ownership within the central banks, within the ministries to take this forward. And for me, that was the key metrics. But we had a very clear 10-point scale with sub-points, et cetera. And we had asked for McKinsey's help to also help us see the impact and review whether what we had done was right or wrong. So at that time, uh, Jiru, this is uh, where you also uh, launched Catalyst 2030. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. In between, I launched one more organization called Acelo and then Catalyst 2030. And so how would then Catalyst 2030 build on that experience and enhance the impact uh, uh, that you were trying to achieve? So child and youth finance was for one system, uh, whereas Catalyst is across all the 180, uh, 194 SDGs that are there. So it's across every SDG and target. But essentially, Catalyst 2030 is what I call a sector body. It's so for social entrepreneurs, by social entrepreneurs and innovators. Now, I always use the term innovators because I think social entrepreneurs cannot themselves change the system. We need academics. We need people in government. We need people across all systems to work with to bring about the change. But Catalyst is primarily of the key social innovators who make the change happen. And we're trying to change policy in many places. We are trying to uh, uh, have collaborations. So when we collaborate, we can do more things. And by doing this, changing the whole ecosystem and the way social innovators and entrepreneurs themselves are thinking. And on this, I'd really like to hand over to Cynthia because Cynthia did an analysis over the past two years on Catalyst. For Catalyst 2030, what is really exciting is looking at pulling together all of the actors who are at the kind of tactical level, I would say, where change really happens and making them the driver of change. Unfortunately, in many cases, we look to those in positions of leadership to make change. But in fact, Real systems change needs to happen at the grassroots, at the at the real tactical level. So what Catalyst 2030 is doing is saying, let's pull together all of those thousands of change makers from across the globe who are working to make change and actually create a body where they can collaborate and start to drive the change themselves. So essentially, it's changing the way social change actually happens. And that was actually one of the biggest learnings from the research that we did. Of course, we found organizations that were working on policy change. We found activist organizations. We found organizations who were bringing together um, network style organizations, um, you know, really bringing together different um, stakeholder groups. But actually what we were finding was that they were doing that with a set of principles and practices um, that were creating a new way of approaching a system. So those principles were actually creating a system that was more responsive to the needs of individuals and groups, and that was going to be um, more representative. So essentially, a more democratic effort for systemic change. So not systems change in the eyes of the privileged few, 
but systems change in the eyes of those who are actually living the issues day to day. And we called those individuals primary actors. Um, those principles um, that organizations were using were fostering connection, embracing context, and reconfiguring power. Is it fair to say that basically the journey that the Jiru led from child childland India to Child and Youth Finance International was really this full circle journey of implementing this system change, following these principles in a particular area. And that with Catalyst 2030, the objective is then to uh, take that to the next level across different, uh, different uh, themes and not just a children's uh, uh, economic inclusion. Yes, it's a journey from, you know, single solutions to systems change. But I think Jeru has always had those principles in mind with each of the organizations that she has implemented. They've just come to bigger and bigger fruition. You know, a big moment was when she went from Aflatoon to Child and Youth Finance because Aflatoon was delivering a very important curriculum to education systems in different countries. But what she found was that in order to assemble even more ecosystem players, they couldn't do it through Aflatoon. It was seen as having kind of a bias, if you will, because they had a solution already that they were promoting in the world. So in order to really do this in a way that people would pick up on and more players would come in, they had to create a new organization, which was Child and Youth Finance. And that Child and Youth Finance International organization became an honest broker. So a neutral player that could assemble all these actors, including policymakers, that would want to come together and not feel that they were being led by an organization that had kind of a certain solution in mind, if you will. So I think entrepreneurs that are thinking about moving towards systems change really should think about the way that they are being perceived by the system. And often it's a new organization that needs to be built in order to assemble those players, a neutral actor, an honest broker that doesn't feel like that others don't feel like they have a, a bias or a, a specific agenda in mind. Does it mean that social entrepreneurs who don't integrate that in the outset in their organization will not be able to achieve system change unless they create a new organization at some point? You know, I think it. I think it depends. I would. I would never say never. Um, you know, but we have seen a trend of social entrepreneurs reaching a certain point where they feel that they are not achieving the big goals that they really want to achieve. So many social entrepreneurs get to a point where they say, okay, I'm serving a million um, individuals, or I'm serving um, even in one case, a um, hundred million um, individuals. We've impacted all of this, but the globe is you know, filled with billions. And, and, and so how do you actually achieve population level change with a single organization, it's just not possible. So I think many organiz many entrepreneurs reach that point where they say, okay, I need to make a shift. And that shift towards this more ecosystem approach, network style approach is something that that I have certainly seen many organizations making that transition. Um, Jeru is, is certainly the one who I think really exemplifies that. Uh, there are other entrepreneurs who have also made a similar shift. In April of this year, the United Nations General Assembly adopted its first ever resolution on the social and solidarity economy. This resolution acknowledges at the international level that social entrepreneurs contribute to system change. Jiru was involved in that initiative. Let's ask her what it means. So the social and solidarity economy is something which has been promoted by the ILO. Catalyst was part of the working group which helped frame the definition it was very clear in making sure social entrepreneurs were mentioned in it. And by doing this, what really is important is three things. Now that the resolution is adopted, we can work with countries to frame the policies which are needed. So we've already created the material which is necessary to do that. Two is because there are social innovators in most countries, we can help change policies and give social innovators a seat at the table. And three, by working closely, we can actually accelerate the impact. We also get the corporate sector involved in working with us. 
So I always say it's a group effort and everybody has collectively worked to make this happen. And being that enabler and catalyst is not just the name of the organization, but really seems to be what you do uh, wonderfully in every setting that you are, Jeru. So thank you for that, Cynthia. Did you want to, to react on, on the importance of that resolution and the integration of, of social enterprise in, in that text as part of that dis definition? Why does that matter? Well, I think what's a, what is an interesting thing at stake here is what, you know, what we consider to be the economy. And, and really, I think this has really broad implications for, um, for, for the big systems in our world. Um, you know, if, if we really think about it, economies are made of humans, but we haven't always made economies that work for humans. And I think by including social entrepreneurs in the definition of this, we're really making sure that, um, future economic systems are going to be working on behalf of people, not just on behalf of profit. So I think this is a really exciting moment. Um, I think what's interesting is the definition of social enterprise that we are using. I don't know if we want to get into that, though. Let's put it this way. The positive is that social entrepreneurs have been mentioned. I think, therefore, now we as social entrepreneurs need to claim our space in this. And we need to show the value that we bring to the table. So I think the risk is that because there are so many actors, we may not be taken seriously. But we do. If we come together very strongly, and actually one of our members packed for impact, is leading the dialogue in making sure that we as social entrepreneurs have a seat at the table. So I think there is a big risk. But if we mobilize well, we can overcome that risk. That's what I would say. These definitions, we spend some time on that, right? The definition of social and solidarity economy, but also the, defini the very definition of social enterprise. What is at stake with the evolution of the, de of the definition from the very original one of Bill Drayton that we heard in the first episode to the way this is, this is evolving now? Yeah, I think there's a real risk if we dilute or narrow the definition of social entrepreneur or social enterprise to those organizations that are profit-seeking. I, I think in the original um, use of the term, it was very expansive. It was it was really trying to capture a new way of of doing social change, a way that was really um, bringing in those community activists, those nonprofit leaders, those organizations um, also that had for-profit models, um, but really thinking about social enterprise um, for its real purpose, which is to create social impact, to create better worlds for that we want to live in. Um, and I think if we narrow the definition, we will um, essentially narrow the, the, the real um, privileged actors who are able to pursue this type of work. Um, and that's not what we want to do. Um, I think we'll also limit the opportunity for systems change. What we found is that organizations that are working towards systemic change come in all stripes and hues. Some of them are corporate actors, but many of them are nonprofit leaders. They're activists. They are people working at the very grassroots. And we need to all be working in, um, in concert, in collaboration in order to shift a system. It can't just be one type of actor. There is this whole thing on the impact economy which is very big, and impact investing. And impact investing is now asking for returns of 12%, 18%, 2x, 3x. True social change is not going to be getting those returns because you're working towards shifting systems. And as philanthropic capital goes into impact investing, we are actually risking systems change. And that is my biggest worry currently. So I would really urge that That's something which doesn't happen and philanthropic capital flows more towards systems change work. What's next for you in terms of your big dream for, for change? What's, what would you be completely fulfilled by uh, that, uh, that, 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 you could, that could, you could achieve in, I don't know, the coming three to five years? What's, what's the next big thing for you? The next big thing for me is redefining society as it is today towards making it more inclusive, sustainable, everything. So that's something I've been learning and listening to social entrepreneurs, and that's what's going on. 
how can we work with government, with business, with everyone to create a different societal shift? I don't have the answers. I've just started the research. So to be continued. If I was here a modest beginning social entrepreneur who, you know, I've proven that my organization is having an impact and uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very pressured by these investors to to scale my venture, accelerate my growth. Uh, what would be your key advice to me? Learn to say no. That would be my key advice. I have refused funding very, very often when I have been pressurized. In fact, my very first donor in Childline pulled out the funding because they wanted me to go uh, one way, which was to go scale and fundraise and not work with all the different systems. I told them no to the funding and I'm happy I took had the courage to do that at that age. But So my thing is learn to say no, stay, stay to your convictions. To me, that is the most important. Stick to your convictions, say no. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mission to Change, a podcast by the INSEAD Hoffman Global Institute for Business and Society in collaboration with Intent. If you liked what you heard, please follow, download, and subscribe to the show. Our podcast was created and produced by Human Humans. Original sound, music, and mixing by Palomino. Coordination, research, and script editing by Isabel Stark. You can find me on LinkedIn at Katel Gulven, where you can leave me a message about what you liked and what you learned.